Hello and welcome to the Island Podcast. Today with me, we have two Tokyo Frogging athletes, Marcus Thormeyer and Vlad Morozov. Guys, welcome and thank you so much for making it here. Thank you. <laughs> sort of to start, our, to start us off, how would you analyze the performance of your team in general in season 2020 of ISL? I mean, Vlad, you were a part of Team Iron in 2019. Uh, Marcus, you're a part of the New York Breakers in 2019. So you guys already have a season under your belt. How would you analyze the performance of Tokyo Frog Kings as a rookie team in this season? Vlad, do you want to start? Yeah, um, I think I think it was great, first of all, because it was the first season for the new team, the Japanese team. And we really had no expectations to, you know, get into the get into the ISL, but of course we wanted to win. We wanted to make the final. And, but in the back of our minds, we didn't really think we would make the final. And then it came down to the last match where, I mean, we fought pretty tough in the last match and we still had a chance to make the final. So I think we did great for, for the first debut, debut year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. So kind of the goal in mind was making it to the semis. And the final the semis, was the extra. Yeah, the semis, for sure, the final was like a strawberry on the top, which, again, I didn't think we would, but I knew we, we could have a slight chance. And I think we did well. We fought well. Yeah. And next year, with all of the experience, they will have the, the Japanese coaches, you know. They're not famil- familiar with the NCTS concept. So I think it's going to be a lot of experience for next year. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Marcus, would you agree or do you have a different view of the, of the season? Maybe you thought you guys, I don't know, were bound to be top two and something went wrong along the way. Um, I thought that our team did pretty good as like a new team as well. I agree with Vlad that it was kind of, uh, I think the ISL format is not, it's like something you have to experience. So uh, a new team going into it, like, or not yeah <laughs> it would be nice to make the final but i think we kind of knew that it would gonna it was gonna be really hard and we did put up a good fight um but i think next year this team will come back even stronger after having done this year it for sure will but sort of speaking about 2021 a little bit and do you guys have any health concerns heading into the Olympic Games? And are these concerns at all similar to the concerns you had before ISL 2020? Marcus, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I guess there's like, I have health concerns like right now, just staying in Canada. So I think these health concerns are like probably not going to go away for a long time but i know that whatever happens uh whoever's running what like either the isl or the olympic games that um it's going to be done with the safety of the athletes in mind and the safety of like the host country and the spectators so if it does happen i know that it'll probably it will be like the safest possible way of it happening so i'm not like freaking out i guess thanks marcus much, much same other of the same for you vlad or I don't yeah know. yeah uh for sure i don't have any health concerns as for myself the only concern i have is that you know if you get into the top four when you're ready to go and compete and then out of nowhere you get just that one positive test and that one positive test you know crosses away your whole your whole plans in the competition, you can no longer go. So that's a concern that there's there's that slight possibility that you can just get tested positive once and that's it. Right, and this test could not be even be accurate that you're already out of the competition. Right, right, right. And there could be someone that tests positive on your swim team, you know, and there's a concern that you might, might as well have it at that point. So, of course, there's going to be some concern, but... Everyone is in the same position. Thanks, Vlad, and thanks, Marcus. And sort of um, an additional question regarding the Olympic Games. There seems to be two avenues um, the IOC might take. They're either going to create a huge bubble, much like Budapest 2020 for ISL, but just for Tokyo 2021, 
but the bubble must be absolutely huge to host all the um, Olympic athletes and Olympic staff. Another potential avenue they might take is to vaccinate all the participants. Now, I don't know which route they're going to take, but let's imagine they decide to go the vaccination route. Marcus, Vlad, would you guys be comfortable in being vaccinated in order to participate in the Olympic Games? Or would this be a little over the top for you guys, especially considering the vaccine is kind of... Vlad, you want to start? Uh, Please go ahead. No way to think. Okay, thanks, Vlad. And I'm glad you sort of opened up on this a little bit um, regarding the being slightly out of shape because your personal best results um, would allow you to win almost any ISL, um, any, any ISL event we, we swam here. But can you open up a little bit on what was your training process before you came to the ISL? Did you sort of have difficulties finding pool time or do we, did you struggle with motivation a little bit? You mentioned you took some time off. So it was my plan to take, to take a long break. Uh, I was planning to take maybe half a year off uh, after the Olympics. Uh, supposedly, they would be in 2020. And since the whole COVID started in April, I said, well, that, that's the chance. That's the chance to take it because even if I wanted to train, there was no facilities open, no pools and no GPS. So from April, maybe towards June, I started swimming in the ocean, surfing a little bit, training and training in my garage gym. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's a thing to get in shape, but it's not the thing after which you can go to ISL and compete with some of the best swimmers in the world. So I got I got a month of pretty decent training. But one one month be, um, after six months off was definitely not enough. For sure. Thanks, Vlad. But it seems to me if you had only a month of training prior, it would have made sense to me that you would have progressed as the um, season went on. But, for example, your best 50 freestyle came from your first match, that um, 20.98. Why would you say um, your results... Um, behaved in this matter that your first match was pretty much your fastest that, that's that's what i thought too uh, with dave that was our plan to put pretty good training in in between the matches and race pretty pretty hard you know all of the events but i guess i just got fatigued you know with the training with with so many events back to back to back without the training behind your belt you just you just can't keep going you get fatigued Makes sense. Was this also the reason you took match nine off, just to sort of give your body a recovery? Yeah. Well, it wasn't my decision. That was the coach's decision. Okay. But I definitely got behind that. Okay. Thanks, Vlad. And we're receiving another question from the fans to both of you guys. And um, it basically implies that this is a young swimmer. Um, he has lost motivation to train because um, he hasn't had a meet to participate in in a very long time. And he's asking, how do you stay positive and motivated during this COVID period? Marcus, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, staying motivated is a, uh, it's just, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, it's not easy when you don't have competitions and um yeah it can it can if you like just it can feel like you're just like what am I doing kind of I'm not competing like what am I training for but you can kind of uh, I found that I can just like make little goals every day to keep myself motivated and in it and like um not compete but like race I guess in practice and see if I can get better there. Like, I think racing is really exciting because it's like a culmination of all that you've been working on in training. But I think that you can also like experience that feeling in training as well without competitions, just by like comparing yourself to older selves or just maybe racing your teammates just for fun every now and then. Um, but yeah, it's pretty tough. It's a tough thing to do. Um, and everyone's different, so you just got to find what works for you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And I also believe that there's huge value that comes to your mentality in viewing this, um, this year as an opportunity to get better, to improve upon yourself rather than sort of be unhappy and uh, think, oh, well, when am I going to have the chance to train properly and compete properly? Mm -hmm. Vlad, what about you? How do you stay motivated and happy during this? For me, I think for us, it's sort of easy to be motivated as a professional athlete. Sorry, Vlad, you might have covered your mic. Oh, yeah. There we go. I think when you're a professional athlete, maybe it's a bit easier to be motivated because, I mean, you want to be, you want to be a professional athlete. You want to be the best. But no matter what kind of athlete you are, you always get those motivational spurs. You know, you really want to go to practice. You really want to get better. But I think the more difficult thing is to keep keep that streak going, to keep that motivation going. So one of the things I do, I have on my fridge a large calendar. And I cross up the days where I did a workout, where I did a double workout. So then when you get back to the to the fridge, to the calendar, you see, you know, you, you did training here, 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 you're on a streak. That's kind of, that keeps you going. You don't want to break that. That's just one of the things. Thanks, Vlad. So pretty much if we summarize it, it's short goals, focusing on the positive side and keeping track of your progress. Yeah, yeah. I also think that there has to be like a reward, you know, like with the calendar, you look at it, you look, okay, I did this, you know, I got my reward. Like I did great. So there has to be some sort of reward that keeps you going. The fans. And it goes as follows. Do you have any job or any serious hobby you have outside of swimming? And if you do, how valuable do you think it is in terms of getting you distracted from swimming? Um, a job, I guess a job is something that makes you money. <clears throat> uh, I do some stock trading, uh, stock Okay. Bitcoin trading. Uh, I don't think it's something that distracts me from swimming. I think it's something that I can get back into to take my mind away from swimming. So maybe in some sense, it, in some sense, it even relaxes me. Yeah. You mentioned you surf. Would surfing be something that distracts you from swimming? For sure. I, th I think surfing is kind of a, like a therapy. I mean, here in LA, we don't have forests, we don't have much mountains. So the beach is something closest to nature. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. And I believe someone like Andrea Benino believes that surfing is the best exercise for a sprinter outside of swimming. So there you go. <laughs> Marcus, what about you? Do you have a job outside of swimming or a hobby that distracts you from it a little bit? Um, well, I think my whole swimming career has been looking for things to distract me from swimming. Um, I find that I do best when I'm just happiest in the pool when I'm doing a lot of stuff outside of the pool too. So I'm finishing my final year of under or my final semester of undergrad right now. And that's been really good for me just to do, um, I'm studying environmental science and I love nature and I love research. So being able to do all that outside of the pool has been really nice. And yeah, I also just like <laughs> going on walks and nature, going camping, going to the beach pretty much. Yeah, I would say that I my life is just pretty much going to the pool and then doing stuff to distract me from the pool outside, <laughs> outside of the pool. Okay, thank you, Marcus. And Marcus, I was actually the person who was manually um, typing down all the roaster information way back in September. And your roaster um, struck me with being a little bit unique. You mentioned in your interests that you love insect research. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know what happened in the past four years, but one day I woke up and I was like, I think insects are really cool and I want to study them and probably make a career out of that. So from that day on, it was just 
insect research kind of. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful story of a passion. Yeah. You immediately knew what you wanted to do. Thank you. Yeah. Vlad, um, another question to you from a fan. Um, he's saying that it seems like right now in swimming, there is a trend of bigger, taller sprinters. You're not small by any means, but when compared to someone like Flo, you seem a little bit on the shorter side. Can you give advice to the shorter sprinters what to focus on and how to make yourself successful when competing, especially against bigger guys? Uh, advice? Well, first of all, I don't think you can think about it in that way that taller is faster. You know, taller is also heavier. You have more drag with the water. Your, your limbs are heavier. And it's harder to go through rotations. And you're, once you're, when you're shorter, you're quicker. You can pick up a faster tempo. Uh, you can generate maybe not as much power, but you have less drag, so you could be quicker. So it's not about how tall you are, how strong you are. There's so many more variables that go into swimming because we're not moving through the air. We're moving through them at dense water. Of course. Thanks, Vlad. And also, um, when you're racing against these big guys in the water, the, the wake they create is just humongous. Um, how do you avoid the wake, especially in a short course, sh short course meter spool or in yards? Underwater. Underwater. I mean, you, you can also use the wake. You know, same if, you, if you're shorter, uh, shorter and you weight a little bit less, uh, the way that you can use uh, from a bigger guy is going to help you out more. So you can save up on the first couple of links and try to catch up on, at the end. But out of the turns, it, you just get under it. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. And another question on the um, sprint side of things. One of our fans is wondering, do you think a sub-2050 freestyle in long course meters is possible one day? Definitely. Definitely. I, I think, I mean, I think that they should bring the suits back, <laughs> the, the high tech suit quick, but someone has got 20.9 back in, what was it, 2009? I think it's possible, maybe in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And also, another question to both of you, Marcus and Vlad. Do you believe that the next evolutionary step of fast swimming would some fly kick? Because it seems that like the two most efficient ways, if you if you combine out of the two uh, out of the four strokes, I know that there is a certain complication in terms of timing and sort of getting the rhythm in. But if someone was to achieve it, like for example Michael Klim in his final meters of 100 freestyle. Do you think this would be faster and this would be the next sort of step in swimming to? I think Michael Phelps has tried to do it. Uh, he's, lost, he's lost a year or two years. Uh, I think what is more realistic and more efficient is uh, kind of butterfly kick with the core, but still keep the freestyle kick. So it's something I think Janet Evans did. So it looked like she was doing butterfly with the core, but still kept the freestyle kick. I think that is a little bit more efficient. Unless, I don't know, someone's going to prove me wrong. Interesting, okay. So butterfly core kick, but maintaining the freestyle kick also. Okay. Yeah, so you pretty much lengthen your stroke with the core on every stroke. But still, I'll do the freestyle six bit kick, kick in it as well. But I think at least it's, it's going to be a bit easier than do the whole butterfly kick and freestyle. Okay, arms. thanks, Vlad. Marcus, what do you think? Um, I'm not as knowledgeable on swimming <laughs> biomechanics. Yeah, but. but what Vlad said sounds kind of right, though. Oh, maybe. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Maybe. Um, the sport's always. If you look back, I think there wasn't even 
but so who knows what that be. Okay, thank you, thank you, Marcus. And um, another question from the fans. Um, could you guys mention your favorite set that you've ever done for a hundred freestyle? Uh, Marcus, do you want to start? Uh, I mean, <laughs> favorite set. Let's um, put in an additional criteria. It has to be a hard one. <laughs> a hard set. Okay. Um, I, I don't I don't think I have favorite sets. I think they all just kind of sit at a medium like I'm okay with it. <laughs> so I guess a recent hundred freestyle set I did was just um well I did a half backstroke half freestyle, but it was just three rounds of uh three uh 35 meters just like all out. And I like that because it's like longer than a 20, it was a long course. So it's like longer than a 25, but not quite 50. And then you do three of them and it's like deceivingly hard. How much of a break do you have in between? I think we did them on 90. And then after the third one, it'd be like a 200 easy and then you just do it again. Okay. And all three are from a start. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Vlad, what about for you? Uh, for the 100, my favorite set in high school was 10 100s best average. So you pick, a, you pick a time as fast as you can go that you can keep for all 10 100s. So we would do something like 10 100s on 130, but you have to keep 57s on every one. Then next week you do, uh, do them on 125 and you go 56s and you drop down like that. That sounds like an incredibly painful set. And I'm assuming these times are in yards. That, that was in yards, yeah. But you make it as hard as you want to make it. Yeah, but, but if you, you know, bit, bit a piece more than you can chew, then it's going to be painful towards the end, yeah. Okay, thanks, Vlad. And um, we kind of started the discussion of experimenting in swimming. And Vlad, there was one interesting question from a fan that I thought it would be interesting to ask you. Um, do you recall your 100 freestyle in Barcelona 2013? Uh, yeah, I don't remember the last 25 meters, but yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was the strategy behind starting off with a 21.9? Um, was this <laughs> planned or was it sort of a fluke a little bit? Um, can you tell us more about it? So... Uh, I, th I thought I was pretty ready. I was pretty well ready for that competition. I mean, that's when I got a silver in the 50 freestyle after a Caesar Cielo. But in the 100, <clears throat> in the morning, I, I swam I swam the 100 in the morning in prelims, and it just felt tough. You know, I felt like it was the best time I could do, <clears throat> I could do but I was like a 48 high or something. And then I uh, swam again in the semifinals, I tried my best, my absolute best, but it was like 48 five, uh, maybe even more. So it was not enough, you know, I needed to do something, something different, something extra. So I realized that, that that was my only chance to, you know, go out almost as fast as I can and just try to hold on to your life at the end. But I think the, the bigger problem there was that, I mean, obviously I went out pretty fast in 21 nights to the feet. But after the turn, I saw how much I was beating everyone, but like a full body length, I saw James Magnuson still completing his turn while I was, you know, doing the underwater. And I just got so excited and pumped up that I tried even harder after that turn. You know, I picked up the pace. And then after that, every stroke just got tougher and tougher. And at, at about 75 to 85 meters, I wasn't sure if I was going to finish the 100. <laughs> Oh, wow. Vlad, and let me know if this is too, too much of a personal question, but how, how high does your lactate get after 100 freestyle, if you know it by any chance? I think there are different measurements, but <clears throat> the Russian measurings, we got 24. 24 is very high. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Um, Vlad, Marcus, a question to both of you. You guys were part of a predominantly Japanese team 
And as far as I know, a lot of the Japanese swimmers didn't speak much English. How did you guys end up bonding so well? Because it seems like your team was a cohesive unit. You were cheering for each other really well. You were hanging out as a team together. How did you achieve this with the language barrier? Marcus, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I think a big thing was that the coaches made sure that um, the coaches kind of helped us move as a team. We all did group workouts all the time. And uh, we did like group activations. And, um, and I feel like you don't really need a language when it comes to swimming because you just like watch someone try really hard and work out and go like really fast and you just like thumbs up and they're like, yeah, or they do the same to you. Um, and I feel like also because the team was mostly like the Japanese team, it was kind of like they were already a unit and then everyone who wasn't from Japan just kind of like tacked onto that, which is really exciting to be a part of something like that. Um, it was also like, I don't know, personally, I kept on trying to talk to them all the time, even like basic things like, hey, how are you? And like, are you swimming today? And like very, like not, <laughs> we weren't like talking about anything deep, but I feel like if you do that just a little bit, like every day, it really adds up. And by the end of it, yeah, I have like, say I have like 30 new Japanese friends. And that's beautiful. Thanks, Marcus. But that's more in terms of what you, what, how you interact within the pool. What about outside the pool? I for sure know you guys had a sushi night on one of these nights. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, yeah, everyone is just like nice to each other. There's no one. There's no mean people. There's no like bullies or anything. Everyone just kind of. I think everyone really liked it when everyone else was happy. So everyone would just try and make everyone else happy all the time, which is really nice environment to be in. Um, yeah, and that's just. Thank you, thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I don't know. Makes sense. Vlad, do you have anything to add, or did Marcus set it all? Well, definitely, what helped us was is that we had a translator. Oh yeah, uh, we had like a trans translator manager. So at, at every meeting or whenever anyone had something to say in front of the team, uh, they would translate from Japanese English, English, Japanese. Uh, that definitely helped. Yeah. And I think what helped is that we were one of the teams that uh, trained together. You know, we had three groups and we did the same sets together as compared to some of the teams that everyone was kind of on their own. And I have to tell, we, we did some pretty tough trainings. And when you're in tough training together, that just bonds you pretty tight already. For sure. And that was a very interesting decision from my point of view from Turkey of Falcons to have sort of people train together because other teams didn't do that, especially if you have a look at someone like Energy Standard. Everyone had their own individualized workout. Do you feel like there's value that comes to it in terms of bringing the team together and creating one unit out of it? Yeah. I... I think I would have been so sad if I had to train by myself all the time because like like the one person from Canada so I wouldn't really have a group and I don't know it's just kind of I think it's super like yeah sad and a little like depressing to like push yourself when you're alone and I find it a lot easier when you have like a group of people around you and yeah I was doing like workouts that I've never done before in my life and I couldn't even read them, but I would rather have done that and be a part of the group and bond with everyone. Cause then I know at the competition, like I'll swim faster on relays and like push that last 25 for the team. I I'd much rather do that than just kind of be alone, kind of by myself, just kind of crying in the corner every workout. It makes sense. Um, Swimming is definitely easier in a team when you have someone to struggle together with. But um, Marcus, um, I'm glad you opened up about the fact that you're the only Canadian on the Tokyo Fall Kings. Um, can you tell us how this happened and why you didn't end up on the Toronto Titans roster? 
Yeah. Um, I think, I think it's just like a super long story, but when it comes down to it, it's just that I kind of didn't, I wasn't planning on doing the ISL before the Olympics got postponed. And then when the Olympics got postponed a year, I was like, oh, I might as well join a team. And then I was kind of the last year when I was on the breakers, I heard that the following year there'd be a new team from Tokyo. And then I pretty much told everyone, I was like, I'm going to be on that team uh, because I think it'll be fun. <laughs> so I kind of had my eye on it for a while, but didn't really like follow through with it until I realized that like, oh, I have like this extra year where I could be doing eyes and I'm sure might as well hop on. And Are the of Japanese culture, it might be a dumb question regarding yeah. the, your background. Um, um, my mom is Chinese, so I've just had a lot of exposure to Asian cultures in general. So I'm pretty comfortable around them. And also I think because I'm Canadian, joining the Toronto team would have been kind of boring because I looked at the roster and it was pretty much like the Canadian national team plus them. And I was like, I don't know, I see all these people all the time anyway. That wouldn't really be fun or exciting. So might as well switch it up. Makes sense. Thanks, Marcus. Um, guys, a question to both of you. Um, when you think about Japanese swimmers in general, the first thing that comes to your mind is superb technique, in my opinion. Did you guys see anything different spending this month and a half training together with the Japanese athletes that they do differently from everyone else that allows them to have the technique they have? Because in my opinion, it's unparalleled in the world of swimming, especially if you take someone like Ryasuke Iri in the backstroke. Oh, it's, it's just amazing to see him race every time. So anything, anything you noticed, maybe a tip for yourself. Um, Marcus, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, I've just never seen like a group of people, like everyone so precise and like analytical and like everything is thought out. I feel like before they do it, like ever in my life before kind of to that level, I feel like they're super detail oriented with everything they did. And <clears throat> Sorry, Marcus, we can't quite hear you. I believe your Wi Fi connection isn't perfect. Vlad, do you want to pick it up from here? Um, anything you... you, you oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they, they would uh, tell us to be 24-hour athletes. So in a sense, you think of yourself as an athlete 24 hours a day. You do everything to make yourself better as an athlete. And they're, they're at, the, at the camp, you know. Of course, I would think of myself as a professional athlete, but... I would put maybe four or five hours of, you know, training and stretching and massage, this sort of things uh, a day into my performance. Uh, but the Japanese, the Japanese team, they, they would be there, I mean, 18 hours a day, 16 hours a day. You know, they're not eating or sleeping. They are in the team room stretching or massaging or doing something else that, that's going to optimize their performance. And I've never seen athletes like that. And it's like, okay, now I see that I, I can't just, just think of myself as a 24 hour athlete. I have to, you know, do something 24 hours a day. So that, that's something that really surprised me. Yeah. And like you said, uh, Yuri, Yuri Rusuki, I mean, he has the best probably technique in the world. And he was in the massage room probably six hours a day at least. <laughs> Besides the two, 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 two hour trainings. Yeah. I'm assuming you can't have any hobby, hobbies outside of swimming. If you, if you do the Japanese way. No, right? no, it's, it's just true, truly professional. Now, besides, besides the, the athletes, the swimmers, uh, like we got every morning, we got printouts 
under our under our uh, doors to the rooms of our schedules where we need to be what we need to do what time is the meeting like they would type up the schedule every single day and 6 6 a.m you get it under your door you know just very organized and structured thank you thank you Vlad. marcus sorry you got a little bit cut i believe there was an internet issue do you have anything to uh, sorry about that um I don't know what was said and I don't know when I got cut off, but pretty much just very detail oriented. <laughs> Summarize what I was gonna say. They're very detail oriented, very precise about pretty much everything they do. And it's like, it's pretty admirable to be honest. Um, I feel like I learned a lot, like watching them be like that. I was like, oh, what, maybe I could adopt some of that um, focus into my <laughs> program and yeah I think Vlad is touching to that too how like they spend a large amount of time before workout getting ready for workout and after workout recovering from the workout so they really do this like professional athlete like life got it thank you thank you Marcus yeah, the professionalism of the Japanese is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, we have another question from the fans, and I believe it's a very interesting one. It comes from a collegiate swimmer, and he is saying that he has been involved with swimming for over a decade now, and um, he doesn't see himself um, ever splitting ways with swimming, even when he's done competitive swimming he thinks he will still be involved in the world of swimming in one way or another. And he wants to ask you guys, um, one day when it happens, when you decide to be done with competitive swimming, do you see yourself being involved in the swimming world or taking um, absolutely another route? Um, Vlad, I believe you were an economics major, maybe something oriented over there. Um, Vlad, do you want to start with that? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, it's, it's hard to plan that sort of thing uh, where your life is going to take you. I mean, I'm planning to swim for as long as I can, maybe five, maybe 10 more years. And it's hard to say where I'm going to be in 10 years from now. But it would just make sense to still be a part of swimming because it's something that I probably know how to do the best than anything else. Um, maybe I wouldn't be swimming like I wouldn't be swimming at the master's team, probably. But I would, I would still be involved somehow in the swimming world, yeah. Thanks, Vlad. What about for you, Marcus? Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be involved with the swimming world once I'm done. I think I, I have, like, aspirations. And, like, I've, I've set up my life for when I retire. I'm, like, ready, ready to just you know, cut it, but I, I'm going to like keep results, keep, like uh, keep looking at results for like my friends and stuff and like see how the ISL is doing with the, the Frog Kings team when I'm done swimming that too. Just kind of, but I think getting involved, being involved in the sport um, as a coach, just like, or something or like an official, just like doesn't really seem like the, uh, the path for me or at least not immediately after I retire. Maybe when I get older, I'll just have some random awakening. But right now I, I, I have like my, a little, my life planned out. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks, Marcus. And um, guys, I know you're very busy athletes and I don't want to keep you here on this podcast for too long. But before we part ways, um, we have a little blitz prepared for you. Um, it's a collection of questions from the fans that are a little shorter. Um, you can answer with something short, like a yes or no. It can be a little more sophisticated, but keep in mind that it's a blitz. Um, so with that being said, are you guys ready for it? So uh, if you don't mind, let's go. Marcus, you answer first. Vlad, you answer second. Is that okay? Perfect. Yep. Here we go. What is your average yardage per day? Uh, I guess I do meters. So uh, I'd say like a good workout is like around 5,000 meters for me. 
Okay. 10,000. Same for you? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have pets? I don't have a pet, but my roommate has a cat and I love cats. Okay. Uh, I have a dog, uh, mini Labradoodle, supposedly. We got him a oh, DNA test. We'll see what he is. I'm not sure. <laughs> you did a DNA test for your dog? <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> hey, it's 80 bucks on Amazon, you know, it's okay. <laughs> that is a level of commitment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, how many hours on average do you put in swimming and preparation for swimming workouts a week? Uh, somewhere under 30. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand the question. Uh, how many hours do you spend on swimming and swimming related activities per week? Uh, I'd say about 30 as well. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that like a campus requirement typically in US, like under 30 or 30 max? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Um, do you prefer long course meters, short course meters, or yards? Um, uh, long course meters, uh, my turns aren't great. Uh, so yards sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> okay. Yards, the shorter the better. Okay, we have two polar opposites here, okay. Um, what is your favorite event to spectate in the world of swimming? Uh, maybe uh, I, I like them all equally as long as uh, I, I just appreciate great swimming. So I guess I like them all equally. Okay, fair enough. Vlad? Probably the 100 freestyle. I want to say the 50 because it's the fastest, but the 100, it's also almost just as fast, but there's also some strategy in it. Yeah, it gives you a little bit more time to sort of figure out what's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, what would you say is your, your best event? Uh, the 100 back, but like long course specifically. What about short course? <laughs> would you say 100 free? Uh, probably. <laughs> Short course is just kind of a crapshoot for me. <laughs> okay. Very self-critical, especially regarding the 46-1 in a relay you swam. Come on. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Vlad, what about you? Uh, 50 free. 75 free. 50 free. <laughs> we all wished for a 75. <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, how old were you when you started swimming? Uh, maybe like 10. Nine. Who was your childhood idol if you had one? Uh, I, I didn't, I don't think I paid attention enough to, <laughs> to have an idol. Okay, so. But it could be maybe your dad or Superman, I don't know. Yeah, I think. Michael Phelps. Um, yeah, he's, he's pretty admirable to be honest. So maybe, yeah, sure. I fact, now I feel like I've pressured you into this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. Vlad, what about you? No, it's probably my coach, my first coach. And for there once I got pointed to swimming, Alexander Papa. Okay, thank you. Um, what is your favorite sport to spectate and your favorite sport to take part in? I'm um, counting out swimming. Um, I like watching rugby because it's, I feel like it's simple and it's just like, just nice. To, I don't know, just like watch the field, what's going on. And I like to play beach volleyball just because it's something fun to do in the summer with friends. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Have you ever played rugby yourself? No, I, I think it's too scary. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd fare well. Okay, it's actually a really fun game to play. Also, I feel like if you like spectating it, you you'll enjoy playing it quite a bit. Mm. Um, but yeah, thank you, Vlad. What about you? Uh, probably anything at the beach. Yeah, like the beach volleyball, spike ball, surfing. Both to spectate and to participate in. Sure. Yeah, but I'd rather participate than watch. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. And our last question for today, 
What is your favorite team logo and team uniform? Counting out your own. Um, team logo. I think maybe like London Roars logo, except I don't really like the dark green. So I let maybe the uh, Centurions uniform, just because I think the white looks super nice. And I feel like I would look good in white, just objectively, so. <laughs> you for sure would. Um, yeah, this is actually a unique answer. This is the first time I hear someone mention Aqua Centurion's uniform, but thank you. Really? It's typically uh, Team Iron, New York, Bra uh, New York Breakers. Um, you guys, you guys are the most, most popular answer and the London War. I feel like I look super tan when I wear white, so. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Vlad, what about Give you? Me a <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll probably agree with Marcus. Uh, I like white color in general, so I go Centurions. Okay, both for logo and uniform? Hmm? Both for logo and the uniform? Uh, the logo is probably the same as Marcus. Yeah, London, London War. But that's only if I have to choose. This one is the best still. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, well, thank you guys. And this about concludes our podcast. And before I let you guys go, do you have any final words for the Tokyo Frogging fans? You, you guys have quite a bit, to be honest with you. And especially in terms of athletes. Um, for athletes, the Tokyo Frogging was by far the most popular team, ISL athletes. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. Everyone just loved us. I think we were just the most adorable team out there. <laughs> totally true <laughs> just, just thank you thank you all for following us and we're all looking forward to the third season of ISL coming up <laughs>